السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. عليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعدوان إلا على الظالمين والعاقبة للمتقين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. الحمد لله رب العالمين I think that um, first and foremost I want to thank you all for being here for making it a point to be here and keeping your hearts engaged. MashaAllah, it's been inspiring to see the response of the community. I think to every single action that we've had for Palestine in the last few weeks, whether it is a community dua, or whether it is a protest, or whether it is uh, some form of educational form, uh, to see the way that the hearts are so connected, I think in and of itself is proof that this ummah is not dead. So before I start with anything else, if there is one thing that we take as an immediate silver lining of what is happening right now is that the hearts of the ummah are beating hard and inshallah ta'ala this is a means by which we come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we once again remember that we're part of this one human body this one ummah that the Prophet sallallahu spoke to us about now with that being said you know I, I thought as we talk about this topic of resilience and solidarity uh, with our brothers and sisters in Palestine and how we learn resilience so that we can be resilient like them and for them. Resilient like them and for them. And we'll kind of break that down inshallah in a bit. You know, it's very interesting that the electricity went out today for a lot of us. And it's kind of been flickering on and off. Uh, some of our houses still don't have power. And you can see just in a few hours the way that we start to get uncomfortable with ourselves and we start to you know, wonder what we're gonna do with this and what we're gonna do with that. And you can imagine what it's like for our brothers and sisters in Palestine, in Gaza right now, that have been without power, without fuel, without water, without food, and under the cruel bombs that are financed by the American government, dropped on them by the Israeli government. And here we are, and we learn a lesson. And solidarity can only truly be felt with empathy. And so I think it's a teaching moment for all of us, every single time we experience a little bit of discomfort, to remember what it is like for our brothers and sisters uh, right now. Inshallah ta'ala, uh, we're going to be speaking about the topic of resilience. And resilience has many connotations. And alhamdulillah, we're joined tonight by, of course, Sheikh Yasser Burjas and Sheikh Abdullah Aduru. So this is a community event for us, but we want to get to a very specific angle as we've been talking about Palestine, which is resilience. And I think that as we watch the scenes of our brothers and sisters there, we wonder how is it that they have such strong faith? As much pain as we feel for them, we should also feel for our own spiritual poverty when we see the richness that they have in their iman, the richness that they have in their spirituality. SubhanAllah, the bombs are dropping on them. They are unsus they're not sustained by the things that we expect on a daily basis, yet somehow they're able to breathe dhikr, to breathe la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, alhamdulillah. They're able to breathe, subhanAllah, wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, hasbi Allah wa ni'ma al wakil. They breathe these things so naturally. And that in and of itself is a miracle. And you know, before we get started, because this does hit us close to home, I want to mention uh, Brother Iyad, who was here, uh, our beloved Brother Iyad, who lost 21 members of his family a few nights ago. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on them. Accept them all as shuhada. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow them all to be nestled from the throne of Ar-Rahman in this moment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala join them and all of the shuhada of Gaza with Sayyid al-Shuhada and with al-Salihin and with the Anbiya. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala join us with them. Allahumma ameen. So this is hit close to home. And our hearts are with our brothers and sisters that are experiencing this maybe a little bit deeper. But I want to start with this part. When the Prophet ﷺ says that the mu'min is to the mu'min like a building, that one part of it enforces the other, that means that the relationship of the ummah with each other is a relationship of solidarity. And one of the ways that you develop resilience is when you look at another part of the body and you see the weight that it is carrying. 
And you say, if they can carry those 3,000 pounds, then surely I can carry my 30 pounds. If my brothers and sisters can hold it down like that, and they are carrying the weight of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah that way, then I need to be able to hold it down for them. And one of the most important lessons that we take from this is that it's all interconnected. Your overall righteousness is connected to your brothers and sisters in Gaza. Your overall wickedness is connected to your brothers and sisters in Gaza. So when we are stronger as Muslims, more resilient as Muslims, stronger as a human body in general, then we naturally reinforce that part of the body. We remove some of the burden, some of the load off of them. And that's part of the reason why we want to develop that resilience so that we can be doing our part. And so when someone says, my qiyam, my dua, you know what, your prayers, your qiyam, just the very fact that you're praying qiyam al-layla, the very fact that you're crying before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now, the very fact that you're learning to make dua with more sincerity, the very fact that you've put aside your personal concerns, in a world that tells you to be a narcissist, and you are glued 24 seven to the affairs of your brothers and sisters in Gaza and trying to think of ways to be there for them, all of that is a means by which we become a stronger body. Alhamdulillah And so when it comes to solidarity, individual resilience is part of solidarity. Now there are different words, different terms that are used in the religion for resilience. One of those words is azima. It's very interesting, azima. How do you build determination? You know, if you look at this on an individual level, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah talks about after niya, after intention comes azima, comes determination. It's one thing to say, I want to help my brothers and sisters. It's another thing to try to turn every single stone, to try to look at every single course of action and to situate yourself in every single place that you possibly can so that you can help them. And so one person says, I want to help the people of Gaza. I want to help Palestine. But your azima is the sincerity of that intention, the zeal that you bring, the determination that you bring is the zeal that comes with that intention. And we don't want to just be people of rhetoric. We don't just want to be people that say we want to be there for our brothers and sisters in Gaza and then disappear, right? We don't just want to be people that tune in for the cycle. We want to be people that pace ourselves for the long run. And it's important for us to understand that our enemies, our enemies, because the people that are crushing Gaza right now are our enemies too. So our enemies in the most wholesome sense, they count on us losing spirit. They count on us getting tired. And Imam Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah said, al-shaja'a sabru sa'a, another word that's used. Courage is being patient for another hour. What does that mean? The scholars used to say that, res that patience in this sense is resilience. It's outlasting your enemy for an hour. It's being willing to stay the course and drawing from something that is divine, that defies the laws of just physics and nature, and comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, when you talk about attrition, when there are two people that are competing with one another in a sports match, and I know Sheikh Abdullah can talk a lot about this from a physical perspective. Honestly, you draw from something deeper. Willpower is what they'll call it, right? You have to have a stronger willpower. You have to want it more. As-sabr, as-shaja'a sabru sa'a, the Muslims were always able to outlast because they drew from something greater. They saw something greater. And so we have to pace ourselves and not let our spirits get crushed. One of the beautiful things about our brothers and sisters in Palestine is how long they've been at this. It is resilience to have every sort of trauma inflicted on you and to say, I'm not leaving my home. Allahu Akbar. I'm not leaving my home. What's left of your home? I'm not leaving my home. Can any one of us actually say that if we were in that position, we'd be able to muster up, I'm not leaving my home? So the question becomes, how did they get there? And how do we get there for them? And inshallah ta'ala, as we, as we start to go through some of the questions, you know, with, with Sheikh Yasser, Sheikh Abdullah, I want to mention something that I found very instructive from the ulama in this regard because it'll take us back to Ramadan in a bit. And that is that the scholars say that determination is built through learning to be patient 
with things that you don't desire, with hardship. And to awud nafsak al makarih to make yourself accustomed to, um, adjustable to hardships, to be able to inflict discomfort on yourself on a regular basis for the sake of something greater, so that when a greater hardship hits you, you have already established that type of a relationship with your nafs, with yourself, and with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so waking up for fajr on an early morning, waking up for qiyam, fighting your sleep, fighting your hunger, fighting your thirst, fighting your desires, taking some of the hardship that comes with being a Muslim right now, all of that is you are teaching yourself how to be patient with things that are undesirable because you desire something greater from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so when, I, when we talk about the people of Gaza, they didn't just find a light switch somewhere. They didn't find a light switch on October 8th or 9th or 10th or whenever the bombing started to come down that way. They didn't just find a light switch. This is a light that is being kindled on a regular basis. And then it shines brightest when it gets darker around them. And so a sabr, resilience, is when you are able to endure discomfort for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a regular basis, intentionally. You don't inflict darar, you don't inflict hardship on yourself, by the way, harm on yourself. But you do incur and endure discomfort on a regular basis. One of the sisters that spoke on the, uh, on, on the Yaqeen program that we had two nights ago, subhanAllah, she was talking about our sisters in Gaza. I couldn't believe what she said. She said that the women are going to sleep in their hijab in case they get exposed in a bombing and they want to make sure that they're still practicing that ibadah. I mean, if that does not bring to life the very real example of that woman who came to the Prophet Sallallahu and said that I have epilepsy, Ya Rasulullah, sometimes I I, I am overtaken by a seizure and then I pass out and at a kashaf and I'm laid bare. And the Prophet ﷺ told her to be patient and she would have Jannah. And she said, Ya Rasulullah, can you just make dua then that when I have a seizure, my aura is not exposed? Here you have an example in our day and age of that woman. And she was promised Jannah. These women do that under airstrikes. Where do they get that from? They still pray. You see the pictures of them praying in destruction. How many people do we see on a regular basis? And I don't mean to put us all to shame, but when someone says, I stopped praying because something bad happened, I'm finding it hard to pray these days because I made dua and I wasn't getting the answer to my dua. Look at these people. They make the adhan and they go and they pray in their ruins. And they pray janazah more than they pray salah now, more than they pray their regular salawats, and they're still praying. So the light switch was not suddenly found. They've been making themselves, adjusting themselves to something greater on a regular basis. And subhanAllah, Shaykh, when you read about resilience, they say it's finding meaning in adversity. And the Prophet ﷺ taught us that on a regular basis, we find meaning in adversity. We don't just wait for the adversity to finish, we find meaning in adversity. And we try to gather the lessons of that adversity. When Allah Azawajal says to the community, after the slander of our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, that tahsabunahu sharran lakum, that you think that it's bad for you, bal huwa khayrun lakum, but it's better for you. And then on an individual level, Asa and Takrahu Shay, Wahua Khairun Lakum, you might hate something and it's better for you. The believer finds meaning in adversity, and then we build a community of resilience. We are enjoining one another in good, enjoining one another in patience. And right now, our brothers and sisters in Palestine, they're holding up their end of the deal with showing us and teaching us a lesson in resilience. And alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, the ummah is alive and we want to keep as many of our brothers and sisters alive as possible inshallah ta'ala and be there alongside them. So bithnillahi ta'ala, uh, we're going to inshallah have a panel now and just sort of discuss how do we build resilience? How do we, how do, we do our part here? Learn from them and then also see the end goal. So Shaykh Abdullah, I'll start with you inshallah ta'ala. How do these events keep us resilient in our faith? How do we find triumph in trial, not after trial, in trial, in the midst of it? Jazakallah uh, khair. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our brothers and sisters in Palestine, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them and protect them in their iman, mostly, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our brothers and sisters also that are suffering uh, in Libya and Morocco and Afghanistan and China. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect them. 
uh, really what we are seeing, what we are hearing now is a trial without a doubt. Uh, but it's important to know that that is something that is conditional. I mean, when we see the word resilience, resilience comes after a trial. You fall and then you get back up. You fall and then you get back up. You fall and you get back up. And right now we're seeing this fall with our brothers and sisters right now in an open prison without food or water or even subhanAllah, any means of even exiting. SubhanAllah, it's something that, just as you mentioned, when the lights flickered off, before we left, I stopped my family, I said, just think about what's happening now. We're leaving our home, but there's no lights, there's no electricity. So it's that istishar, it's that, that feeling, that feeling and that empathy that we must have in order to activate what we initially have with our faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the trials, firstly, brothers and sisters, when a trial comes, know that it is a sunnah, a sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is what Allah has predestined and is what Allah has willed subhanahu. But what's most important is when that comes to you, when you face it, not if, but when you face it, what is your response? What is your response? With the reality that we as human beings will fall short or with the reality that we as human beings will get emotional, we will get sad. And this is normal as human beings. This sadness when you watch on the news, watch on your phone, when you read inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un, when you hear with your brothers and sisters, like our brother that has suffered, you know, his family members have passed away and we have some in our community as well, you read those text messages and then you recite it to yourself and you say, subhanAllah, what if it was me? And it makes you sad. This is normal as the Prophet ﷺ was sad when his son passed away. And he mentioned that his eyes shed tears and the heart is saddened. But at the very end, he said, We will not say anything that displeases our Lord Subhana. So Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala created us as human beings, but even within the word anas or insan, some scholars mention comes from nasiyah which means that there is a level of negligence or forgetfulness. And that is exactly what took place with our father Adam alayhi salam. So with this natural trait that we have that Allah has created and put within us, there is a time frame that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us to be human. But at the same time from our humanity, there is a time frame for us to come back. Whether it's inaba, turning back to Allah. And that's why it's so important during the times of rakha, the times of ease, that one is still turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, subhanAllah, you know, I was mentioning um, in the chapter of uh, Al-Imran, and I tell my community and all of us that this is the time for us to read Surah Al-Imran because it speaks about certain trials, particularly that of the Battle of Uhud, which took place in Medina a couple of years after Hijrah. So we see when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with this battle, some would consider, we say that the Muslims lost, quote unquote, in this battle. There could even be a level of disappointment, a level of sadness, because we'll see, we see what took place. In the beginning, they were winning. But when those on Jabal al-Rumah came down, some of them came down, they didn't obey the message of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, may Allah be pleased with them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was mentioning a statement that one of them mentioned about Abu Sufyan. When he with his army, when he was non-Muslim, when he came as the general of the army of the Meccans and he wanted to annihilate the Muslims. What was mentioned when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was giving a description of the believers. When he said, it, the ones that when people come to him, either قَالَ لَهُ nas. I want to capitalize on this portion of this verse. When people came to the Prophet ﷺ, as was mentioned, and they said, that all of mankind, or particularly some scholars mentioned, was Abu Sufyan in particular, which, which was a representative of all of the Meccan army at that time. They've come as a battalion against you. You are more in number. What did he say? Fakhshawhum. Be fearful of them. Just stop right now. How many times do we see on the media the messaging from these news agencies, major news agencies, and they come with this mes messaging for us to say, the Muslims have lost. They come with this messaging for us to say, we are destroyed. 
to where this sadness will persist and possibly lead to despair. And that's where it can be problematic. Not the sadness. The sadness, rather, is from our iman. The anger is from our iman. But the despair is where there's a fine line. So when he said, فَخْشَوْهُمْ fear, fear them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after that, mentioned what happened to the mu'mineen at that time internally. فَزَادَهُمْ imanan. When that what one would expect, the one that is, does not have an ultimate purpose in life by turning to Allah ultimately, initially and ultimately, Allah is my motivation and Allah is my destination. The reason I do something is for the sake of Allah because I want to be with Allah. Subhana. So when that statement of fear came to them, it increased their iman. It increased their iman. It increased their iman. And that is how the trial is the sunnah and the means, the means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses for you to strengthen your faith. How many videos have we seen? Some brothers and, my, and sisters in my community, they'll send a text message, they'll send, you know, our brothers and sisters, they're running and they're repeating this. They're running out of breath. Allah is sufficient for me. And that's exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said after that. The ones that their iman was increased, and they said, Allah said, and they say, Allah is sufficient for me. And he is the most excellent of those that is relied upon. This is important as well. Allah is showing the statement of the believers in a time of trial and tribulation. That when that time of trial comes, you say, Allah is sufficient for me. And what does that even really mean? That when I, the more that I get to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ease, the more I will know him in hardship. And this is a beautiful hadith the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a portion of his hadith, and this is a conditional sentence. The Prophet is saying, Ta'arraf ilallah fir rakha. Get to know Allah or come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in times of ease. What will happen? What's the result? Ya'rifka. He will know you in times of hardship, meaning that he will be there. Allah is always there for all of us, and it is a test for us to see what is our response. What is our response? Response And with that response of making the attempt to do better, as the Sheikh mentioned, making that intention with yourself, setting your alarm, inshallah, at least five minutes before Fajr goes off. I'm going to wake up, I'm going to wake my children up, and I'm going to have them be a little uncomfortable because with uncomfortability comes success. And that's ultimately, generally, how the trial can be a means of triumph. The choice that you make to be a better person, to be the best version of yourself, particularly in times of hardship. And when you see that, know that it is a huge opportunity to be a stronger believer, to be a believer even, because some of us, this could be a catalyst for us to start praying. It could be a catalyst for us to start praying five times a day, a catalyst for us to wake up in the middle of the night. And remembering that beautiful statement, Hasbi Allah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is enough for me. Allah is enough for me. Turning to him, I'm sufficient. It is enough for me. The predestination of what have taken, taken place with our brothers and sisters in Palestine, I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a bigger plan. What Allah has allowed to happen, I will try my best to go through the process, process of resilience. And that's what I want to end on. Well, like, it is a process. It is not something overnight. You know, I couldn't imagine, subhanAllah, if a family member, family members of mine passed away and you see it on the news or you hear it from someone, it's a process. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al-Alim, Al-Hakim, the all-knowledgeable, the all-wise, knows that it is a process. But he wants us to stick through it because that is ultimately what the believer is in those characteristics because he is ultimately the one that we trust on. وَنِعْمَلْ Wakil, and he is the excellent one that we trust in ultimately. So really the trial is a means for us for triumph if we trust in him ultimately.
and we turn back to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and do not rely on those things that could bring us down a slippery slope because there, sometimes there may be a rough patch back. SubhanAllah, I think that one thing, Shaykh, when you say, It's a powerful hadith that fits the situation. Get to know Allah in good times, and he will know you in, in, in bad times. Good times are very relative. The best times of the people of Gaza are probably your worst nightmare. Their best times, right, are things that we would consider of the worst of ahwal, ashad al ahwal, the worst of situations. But it is perspective. To them, rakha is what? The fuel turned on, the electricity turned on. We're not getting bombed right now. We're able to have our weddings and have our social activities in this open air prison without the prison guard violating us in the moment. That to them is rakha. That's their good time, right? So it's perspective, and you got to think about that. And uh, the reality is, is that if you never knew shidda, if you did not even know what real hardship is in the first place, and I'll speak to myself. I'll speak to myself. I don't know what real hardship is. I've never been tested like that. I've never been tested like that, right? So I don't, I'll say I don't know what real hardship is. But that comes back to the more you know Allah, the less important that all becomes. All of that relativity is then factored in. There's a saying, subhanAllah, that at once, I'm, I'm probably mixing up a few sayings, but you know, you can't reduce your tests, but you can choose to not be reduced by them. And truly, your trials are gonna come and you're not going to be able to choose what selection of trials are given to you in life. In the same way, you're not going to really be in control of what selection of blessings come in your life. But you can choose as a person to not be reduced by them. And in the c case of the Muslim, that is a ta'alluq billah. That is a connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That connection cannot be disrupted. The cell phones are cut, the lines are cut, but their line to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is still there. They still have that connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So long as that is not disrupted, the sense of purpose is not disrupted. Uh, Sheikh Yasser, I'm going to turn it to you. And uh, Sheikh, now if you could talk to the sira component of this. I think that you know, a lot of this resembles sort of that Meccan period, right? The early Muslims, the struggle of the early Muslims that look and find hostility in every direction. Can you kind of walk us through how we can learn resilience through that? يا رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا ثم ما بعد سبحان الله before i get to the sira component i was just uh, thinking about what you guys were saying about hard times and convenient times and so on i couldn't help but uh, remember the statement that uh, um, hard times create strong men and strong men create convenient times and convenient times create weak men and weak men create hard times and the cycle is going to go on and on and on and on. So for us, we are living in convenient times, subhanAllah. And that's why you see how the society in America, you know, forget about the 1950s uh, after the Second World War and then after that, subhanAllah. Those strong men that we now we say, the veterans that we were in those times, they create convenient time for the society that came afterwards. And now we're suffering because of that convenient time, creating, unfortunately, weak leadership and weak, weak people, even to the level of, unfortunately, that, that emptiness and morality in that sense. So um, when we look at the brothers and sisters in Gaza, I'm sure that you guys have seen a lot of these viral videos um, about this young kid, they remember, subhanAllah, this young kid who was pretending to be a reporter and reporting about Gaza. And as he was reporting, uh, suddenly um, a bomb or artillery, actually a rocket, came over his head. So he just paused and looked up, and then he heard the bomb and he continued, continued reporting. Like nothing happened. He didn't flinch. He didn't move, he didn't want to hide, nothing. He continued speaking. And just like, where is this strength coming from? Seriously, subhanAllah. People just going about their lives and trying to get the best out of these difficult times that are going through, subhanAllah. And then I see also, I saw just today a video when little kids are playing in a trench that was just open in the ground. They made a big ditch actually in the ground, preparing for the mass grave that they're gonna be actually burying the people in them. And these kids were playing. They were jumping in that space and having fun, you know, with, 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 the, with the new thing that happened in, in, their, in the street. And then when the camera came to them, they said, well, we just, we're having fun right now, we're playing with this, we never know, we might be buried here too. 
I'm just like, wow, they're saying it and they're speaking as it's just like no seriousness to the matter of death to them, subhanAllah. They don't fear that death. So where this is coming from, true, where this is really coming from. I think I learned that really recently even from another video that came. Maybe some of you have seen that video. Somebody forwarded it to me actually. An un-Muslim lady who uh, uh, was also observant of that resilience of these people and these kids. And she was wondering where this is coming from. For somebody told her it's from their Quran. So she never read the Quran before. So what, did she, what she did, she went actually and she started listening to the Quran. She found an audible version of the Quran. She was listening to the Quran and she was mesmerized by the messages that she was getting from that Quran. And she goes, no wonder. No wonder these people, they find that strength and that resilience and that power actually. It's in their teachings. And we can see that from the seerah, from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu at the beginning of the revelation, obviously. So in the Meccan period, if we look at how uh, the Sahaba were conducting themselves and what were the teachings that were given to them and for 13 years, imagine, 13 years of their time in comparison to 10 years in Medina. 13 years, the Sahaba in Mecca, in terms of the numbers, were, were few. If you look at the ratio of the Muslims who were in Mecca all these 13 years in comparison to the number of Muslims who embraced Islam in 10 years afterwards, that number was very, very little. The number of the Muhajireen that came from Mecca to Mecca was very, very low, but they were the strongest of the strongest because they were very well prepared during those hard times and those difficult times in Mecca. The Meccan era and the Meccan period was all about building a strong believer, a strong individual. That's why in Mecca you don't see Salatul Jama'ah. There was no congregational prayer in Mecca. There was no fasting together in Ramadan in Mecca. There was no collective, you know, act of ibadah that they all had to participate in, in the, uh, collectively as a, as a jama'ah, as a group. There wasn't. But they were responsible to do their own duty to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost. So in the first year after the revelation of Iqra, the Sahaba radiallahu anhu were given the order to pray tahajjud. They were ordered to pray tahajjud for an entire year. Every single night they were ordered and commanded to pray at night. I mean, you guys in Ramadan, when we do that for 30 days and 30 nights, you know, back to back, half, not even halfway, the first few days, Masha were very excited. Maybe day four, night five, night six, the masjids are empty already. And by the time Ramadan is over, what happens to the hajjud? We put on the shelf until the next year. But these Sahaba, they worked on this for an entire year. And then finally they came to the Prophet and complained, Ya Rasulullah, we can't take this anymore, it's too much. Can you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easier on us? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made that ibadah to become optional, not obligatory anymore. So when it became optional, it became voluntarily, they did not stop. Now they have a choice, so they chose to do it even now even more. Because now they have a choice, subhanAllah. That built resilience for them. These people, when they embraced Islam, the Iman in their heart was strong and powerful. It was noticed even by the people around them. They were shocked and surprised. How could they handle all the pressure they had to go through? Look at Bilal, for example. Bilal, radiallahu in which he was, uh, uh, every single day, his master at the time, Umayyah ibn Khalaf, he would bring him and drag him all the way in the middle of Mecca or in the desert, outside in the desert, and bring him a boulder or rock to put on his, on his chest and ask him to renounce his faith and curse the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu And he would deny, he says, absolutely not. And he keeps saying one word, he says, ahadun ahad. I believe in one and only one. I believe in one and only one. And they will be enraged by that. They keep trying. And he himself, he said to them, if I know another word that makes you more, more actually angry, I would use it. But he keeps saying one and only one because he believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We've seen Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala warda when he became Muslim as well. And Abdullah bin Mas'ud, for the context, yani Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, in terms, of his, in terms of his physique, he was actually a, a very tiny man. He wasn't a strong, big man. He was very little, actually. But when he embraced Islam, he loved the Quran, and his voice was so beautiful with the Quran that he decided to go and decide that publicly in the main court in Mecca, where the, the leaders of Quraysh would be there listening. Although he was warned against it, but he didn't mind it. So he went and he was the first person to ever recite the Quran publicly. What was the result of that? Abu Jahl, one of the big guys in Quraysh, came and slapped him, severed his ear. But he said, I'm going to do it again. 
and he kept trying to do it again. Why? Because I am going to decide the word of the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala between them so they can listen to it. Where did they get that resilience from? We look at Khabab ibn Arad, Suhaib ibn Rumi, and all the other Sahaba, عنهم, and then later on in the history of the seerah, all these Sahaba were put together in what we know today as concentration camp, which he called Shaib Abi Talib. Literally, they were physically were removed and put in one valley, and they were barricaded over there, not allowed to, give, to come in and out as they, as they wish, and they were banned from trading with them, marrying from them, dealing with them, so no, they cut them off completely, ostracized from the society, socially, financially, you name it. Few people were helping them out secretly because they still believe they're relatives, no matter how. So they smuggled some you know, humanitarian aid to them here and there and every now and then. To show you how difficult it was, Sa'ad ibn Waqqas, the companion of the Prophet وسلم, he said, one night I wasn't able to sleep, I was so hungry. I haven't eaten in days, he said. So he got up at night and he started looking around for something to eat. There was nothing, no grass, no leaves, nothing left. He goes, I remember, he said, that night I stepped on something that was soft and tender. So I bent down, I grabbed it, put it in my mouth. He goes, until this day, I have no idea what, what that was. But just something to satisfy their hunger with. And then, when you look at that, why they remained so strong during those difficult times. So the ulama, they, they study the seerah. And they say the number one reason for that, the number one reason for that, is their strong iman and belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once you subjugate yourself to one and only God, people become irrelevant to you. Once you believe that you belong to Him, then everybody else becomes no nothing to you. That's why as Muslims, what do we say? Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. We always say these words. We all belong to Allah, and our return shall always be back to Him. So if you believe that you belong to Allah, who is out there who can subjugate you to, to themselves? Why would you even subjugate yourself to anybody? To their whims and desires and their plotting and so on. You're strong right now because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is on your side. We've seen that when the Prophet sallallahu was in the cave with Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was anxious. And what did he tell him? قَالَ تَحْزَنْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعْنَا Don't be sad. Allah is with us. That strong belief that Allah is one and only and is with me subhanahu wa ta'ala is so powerful. It really frees them from any want or any need or any dependence on anybody. The second thing we know about the Sahaba radiallahu anhum that made them be so strong is their strong belief in the Akhirah, in the Akhirah, which means in the hereafter, that they believe this life is temporary. This life is just a test. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepares for the believers you know, a better life. That's why the Prophet says about this world as what? This is just a sijin, this is a prison for the believer. And the akhirah is gonna be actually their freedom. So when they believe in that, and if you look at the Quran, the Makki Quran, most of the verses of the Quran, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking to the people, highlighting these two things. You believe in Allah Azza wa Jal, strengthen your iman in one God and only one. And number two, believe in the hereafter, that there's a day of judgment, which means you now at ease you're gonna be compensated for what you've done in good deeds. And you know that all these people also gonna be returned back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one's gonna get away with what they're doing. And even if I don't get my right here, I will get it in the akhirah. And that's something that gives you that sense of strength and stability as well too. These Sahaba also, they learned that from the history of the, uh, uh, the nations from before. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that story in the Quran for what reason? He spoke about the Pharaoh, he spoke about uh, the story of, of uh, uh, Ibrahim السلام, and his father and his people. He spoke about Prophet Noah and his people. You can imagine all these stories. What's the reason for that? To tell us that we're not the only people gone through trials and hardships. And eventually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them trial. So when we get into that point, we realize how serious the matter is, subhanAllah. So I think it's extremely important for us when we look at our brothers and sisters in Gaza, Unfortunately, we think that we're grieving, you know, we're grieving for them, right? And for what they're going through. Here's a fact that I really, when I observe what they're going through and the thing that they have to run through and so on, they don't even have time to grieve. Like literally, there's no time to grieve. From one bomb to the other one, from one massacre to the other one, and from one death to the other one. So they don't even have time to grieve, Ajima. They're simply just gonna have to pick up the pieces and just move on. We're grieving on their behalf. And frankly, 
Instead of us teaching them lessons, we should learn from them. We should learn from them how to be resilient. Allah Alam. Jazakallah khair, Shaykh. SubhanAllah, the hadith of dunya sijn al-mu'min. They call Gaza the world's largest open-air prison. Dunya as a whole, this whole world is an open-air prison. SubhanAllah. And it's about perspective once again. You know, I'm thinking about Mecca and what you're mentioning, Shaykh. Like, imagine that, um, that moment where uh, Khabab ibn al-Arat radiallahu anhu comes to the Prophet وسلم, Because there's this idea of like, we know we have the truth on our side. Rasulullah we've seen this man split the moon. We've seen Rasulullah split the moon in two halves by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's permission. You've seen trees and stones cry for him alayhi salatu wasalam. You've seen some of the miracles around the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam. And you know that he is Rasulullah and that his dua is not rejected. And Khabbab radiallahu anhu walks up to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam and he's got you know when they say skin in the game? He's got no more skin left to give to the game. He has no more skin on his back. It's been burnt off in torture. Skinless back. And he sees the Prophet وسلم, and he says, Ya Rasulullah, Aren't you going to make dua for us? Aren't you going to ask Allah to give us victory? And the Prophet وسلم, he responds to him and he reacts to him with what? Look, there were people that came before you that were placed in the ground and sliced into two because they said, La ilaha illallah. You're being hasty. Now, subhanAllah, there's so much that you can unpack from that in Mecca in particular because there's no end in sight in Mecca. There is no end in sight in Mecca. There is no superpower that's coming from outside to save you. Remember how... Medina was a surprise gift to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Romans are not coming to help. The Persians are not coming to help. No one's coming from outside to rescue this group of people with a new religion. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says to Khabbab with full confidence, you're being impatient. Hold on, you're being impatient. He's saying that to a man with no skin on his back anymore. Allah will certainly give victory to this affair. Do not be impatient. SubhanAllah, in this regard, you know, there's a frustration that grows, right? Every day you're seeing it and it seems to be getting worse and worse and worse. And we've only been in this now for a few weeks in this particular episode of the ordeal, right? I mean, if you've been engaged in sort of the, the occupation and what's happening with it all this time, that's one thing. But this last episode is only a few weeks and every day it's like... You're waiting for the miracle. Do not be hasty. Do not be hasty. Do not be hasty. I think that's where that individual ibadah that you're talking about, Shaykh in Mecca, is so important. So Medina comes around and you have a community now. And Alhamdulillah, I think one of the things that we have is we do have a community. So as much as you have the voices of suppression from the media and from the political establishments, I think there's something inspiring about the streets of the Ummah being filled and the connection that Muslims are forging across continents, despite social media platforms trying to shut them down, that are expressing the sense of community solidarity. So what does this look like now on a community level when we have that in the, in the Madani phase, if you will, with the Prophet I will look at the, the Madani uh, situation phase. We said that in the Meccan era, the focus was on building strong individuals. Once these individuals became strong enough when they moved into a community, what do you expect they're going to produce? A strong community. So when they build that strong community, but how, how was it? What, how, what made them so strong and resilient? Especially now when you talk about Medina at the time of the Prophet Sassam was Yathrib, which was not of so significant city or town actually in the Arabian Peninsula. It wasn't like At-Ta'if, Bani Taqif, a big actually community, or Mecca, or anything else around it. It was something on the road of their path to go to Asham. It wasn't significant. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it so significant because that small group of people who believe says, you know what, we're willing to take you in, we'll support you. So the Prophet said at the moment he arrived in, in Medina, the first thing he worked on is strengthening the ties of the community, obviously. And the first thing he did is that the pact of brotherhood, al-mu'akha, so he made them into brothers and sisters, literally, 
as if they became like blood brothers and sisters, that you live with them, you marry from them, you uh, assist them, you help them out in every aspect, every way that you can think of. It's like saying nowadays we have refugees, for example. You know what, their circumstances are very unique and different than our circumstances. When they come, how can we help them, subhanAllah, strength, live that life so they become strong as part of the community as well. That's something the Prophet did to the community in Medina. And what did he do? He made sure that he built that community based on brotherhood and sisterhood. Now, that's what the Shaykh Omar began the, 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 uh, the conversation with Hadith al-Nabi Sallallahu You are like one structure. You strengthen each other. So Alhamdulillah, I think, one of the things we learn is that the Ummah is strong because of the teaching Shaykh. Not because of any particular leader or any particular geography or any particular circumstance. It's because of the teachings of the Quran, the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Like I remember hearing SubhanAllah speaking about the Muslim community in general. So there's one, one thing unique about the Muslim community, it, it's a living organism. What does that mean? It thrives anywhere it goes. No matter what the circumstances are. It thrives anywhere it goes. Why so? Because you build your life around Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the first thing you think about is what? We need the masjid. And then we need to start to having Quran classes. We need to come to the masjid. We need to do this, we need to do this, we need to do this. When the community grows around the masjid, you're growing around the notion and the idea of what? You worship Allah and only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That in itself is so powerful. Nothing can kill that. So the Ummah is always as, as strong as a community as long as we have the same principles. We always thrive, alhamdulillah, if we hold on to our teachings. Which is why Umar al-Khattab, he mentioned this very famous statement where he says, قال, We are an Ummah that have been dignified by Islam. If we seek dignity throughout anything else, we will not get it. We will be actually humiliated. So as a result, what I would say is that for us, يعني, we need to uh, strengthen that ties of brother and sisterhood. Yani we, we, we ache when we see someone else aching, and of course, you know, subhanAllah, in, in pain. But I also want to extend that. Part of being, subhanAllah, Muslim, being compassionate, even with the non-Muslims. Even in that sense, that our, actually, our rahmah extends to everybody. So therefore, we need to make sure that you look around and see who is in need of, of help. We look from one community to the other around us until, inshallah, strengthen the entire community that we live in. Bismillah, tabaraka wa ta'ala. Sheikh Abdullah, I want to give you, inshallah, a chance to comment. Obviously, Sheikh, you've been listening to a lot. I'm sure you have some reflections. So instead of me asking a question, just any final thoughts you'd like to share with us, inshallah, and then we'll have a closeout message from all three of us. No, inshallah. SubhanAllah. The statement that you mentioned by Umar al-Khattab, when did he say it, SubhanAllah? When he opened what? Quds, when he came in, subhanAllah, when he answered Palestine and he opened Quds, subhanAllah. Uh, that's the, when he said that statement, it was a statement of humility. And that's ultimately what this connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should make us, is, is humble. Humble towards him, humble towards his creation. And there's one beautiful dua I, I really want to end with, and I remind myself of it, and subhanAllah, in these times, the fortification of the heart, and making sure that the heart is pure, that it is, that it is soft, and that it is firm. Being that it's pure for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's a beautiful dua that I want all of us, I think all of us know this dua, and I hope we say this dua in our sujood because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say this in his sujood for resilience because there will be times that the heart will be saddened to the degree to where you will ask Allah, meta nasrullah. When is the help of Allah? As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, the companions even said, ala inna nasrullahi qareeb. The help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is near. Sometimes your heart will say, okay, okay, I know that. But when? Okay, just dua. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say in his sujood, Ya muqallib al qulub. Everyone repeat after me. Ya muqallib al qulub. Thabbit qalbi. Ala deenik. This is a beautiful dua. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to say this in his prostration. When looking at the word qalb in and of itself, some scholars mention that they call the word qalb because it yataqallab, or some say li anuhu qalibu shay, that it is something that is consistently in movement, or it is something that accepts what comes to it. It's like a wi'a, like a container. So when the Prophet sallallahu firstly acknowledged the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by saying, ya muqallib al qulub, acknowledging his greatness, knowing him, understanding his properties and his qualities. And that's the first thing. 
when we have these experiences that we go through, it is important that we always try our level best to resort to Allah and seeing how did he use these ayat that are in front of me and how did I embark upon the usage of them in a way that's pure, that's uh, b blessed, in a way that he is pleased with. Because subhanAllah, I remember when I became a, a, a new Muslim, I remember the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the chapter of Munafiqun, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya ayuhal ladhina amanu, la tulhikum amwalukum wa la awladukum an dhikrillah. O you who believe, do not allow your children and your money to divert you. Ilha tulhikum. Alha kum attakathur. You have been di distracted from gathering things in abundance. So distraction is that which takes you away from traction, which takes you away from that which is more purposeful. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, do not allow your children and your money to be a distraction for you. From the remembrance of Allah. Children and money, this is what Allah gives you. It is a form of sustenance. It is a form of something that you can look at and use to remember him more. But if it is the opposite, that's where it can make the heart weak. When our hearts are weak for our children or for the money, that's when the choices that we make can take us away from the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam acknowledges that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ultimately the one that is in control of the heart. So what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, ya muqalli, acknowledging him, that should be for us a sign that we should get to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more from everything that we encounter, as Sheikh Omar mentioned. Anything that we encounter, try to associate it to how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving me this, how it is a sign, and how I'm showing thankfulness to him by calling on him. And then he asks him for something. Thabbit qalbi. Make my heart firm. Make my heart firm. So what is that? Ya muqallib al The heart that is constantly, I'm happy one day. I'm sad. I'm asking Allah why. I don't want to speak. I'm very angry. These consistent emotions. Thabbit qalbi. Make my heart firm. But my heart firm upon what? Ala dinik. Ala dinik. Ala dinik. Ala shari'atik. Ala qada'ik. Ala qadrik. To make my heart firm in believing in your predestination. That what you have planned, it is for a divine wisdom. It is for a divine reason. And with that being the case, this is how one gets that resilience in times. And let's be honest, there will be times as human beings, we will be, all of us were caught off guard on October 7th. All of us were caught off guard. But what happens at that moment? What happens a couple of moments later? What happens when we're crying and that anger comes to us? What do we say? What do we say moments after that, days after that? Ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qalbi ala deenik. Because I cannot do it by myself. So it's important that subhanAllah, what we've heard from the time of the companions, to look at their lives, to see how subhanAllah, Shaykh Yasser mentioned elo so eloquently, how we look at what they're going through as a lesson for us to look back at ourselves, look in the mirror, and asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one that makes the hearts firm, to keep us firm on his faith by knowing him more and using these ayat, whether it's a time, whether it's something that we're going through within ourselves, to use it as a sign and it means to make the right choices to come closer to him. And without a doubt, brothers and sisters, as was mentioned before, it will take you being uncomfortable being uncomfortable, being uncomfortable. And we just got a small dosage of it. SubhanAllah, I almost hit a car on the way here because the lights were off in the parking lot. And then all of a sudden, the lights came on. All of a sudden. And it just reminded me again, right before I left home and reminded my family that SubhanAllah, just that small moment of darkness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can bring the light at any particular time. But what are we doing individually and collectively to keep our hearts firm? with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that time of ease because his nasr as he promised it's qareeb and Allah knows best Jazakallah khair so I'm going to go ahead and close out Sheikh if that's okay inshallah do you have yeah, some bismillah please go ahead uh, just uh, so, uh, if someone wants to take for example an action item to do in order to build their resilience uh, I want to remind ourselves that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as he was given his da'wah qal fa'idha faragta fansab wa ila rabbika farghab when you're done giving the da'wah and when you're done going out there and 
putting yourself to, uh, in the streets and the roads and uh, inviting people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, dealing with the hardships and so forth with the people. Once you're done with that, he says, wa ila rabbika farghab, then fansab, uh, faragta fansab, when you're done, stand in worship until you feel fatigued. Now that's unusual because when someone is done doing something as important as giving da'wah and they come back, what do you ask them to do? Rest, take a break. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling him, there's not a time for you to rest. There's a time for you to stand up and start building yourself. So if we, alhamdulillah, many of us maybe participated in the rallies and went, helped out here and there and went online, make some comments and put some posts and so forth. This is all beautiful. Now my question for you, how are you building your own resilience? How are you, how are you strengthening yourself? So here's how you do that. Number one, knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ what is your knowledge about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How strong your knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is it strong enough? Is it strong enough for you to make everything else irrelevant when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If not, you need to start working on this. Number two, with knowledge, you build your iman, faith. And faith is in the heart. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَطْمَئِنُّ قُلُوبٌ بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Those who have faith and their hearts find peace and tranquility to the remembers of Allah, because indeed through the remembers of Allah, the heart will find peace and tranquility. You need to work on that. Number three, that faith should result into yaqeen, absolute certainty. When Allah described the believers at the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, الَّذِينَ He said, أَلِفْ لَا مِيمْ ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ وَالْعَرَبَ فِي هُدَى الْمُتَّقِينَ الذين يؤمنون بالغيب ويقيمون الصلاة وما رزقناهم ينفقون والذين يؤمنون بما أنزل إليك وما أنزل من قبلك وبالآخرة هم يقينون. He speaks about speaks about the believers, those who have no doubt in the book, those who believe in Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, they believe in the غيب, the unseen. They pray, they give their zakah, they believe in what's revealed to you, what was revealed before you, وبالآخرة هم يقينون. They're absolutely certain about the day of judgment, and there's an end for this. Number four, after you have these three things, you put this into action. Al-amal, which means I need to translate that into action. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Quran says what? Alladina amanu wa amilu salihat. Amanu wa amilu salihat. You have faith now? Prove it. When a man asks the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, how should I understand Islam? Tell me something about Islam. I don't have to ask anybody after you. What did he say? He said, Qul amantu billah thumma staqim. Say, I believe, then prove it. Remain steadfast. Don't fluctuate in your faith and your, your practice. So prove it through your actions. And the last thing, when you do that, what is left for you right now is to put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and put your tawakkul on Allah azza wa jal. I have my knowledge that produce iman in my heart. Hopefully it make me so certain about things. I put that into action and then I put my trust in Allah azza wa jal because I believe he's in charge of everything. That would bring resilience. Wallahu alam. Jazakallah khair, Shaykh. I want to leave you all with this point, which inshallah I hope you all hear me very carefully on this. Very similar to what Sheikh Yasser said. You know, the Prophet ﷺ talked about this idea of walking with a person in need until you complete their need. Hatta yaqdi alahul haja. Till you finish the job, till you see that person to the finish line. I think that one of the greatest risks that we have right now in the initial excitement of activism and the initial uh, sense of rage and the initial sense of empathy and, and seeing everything happening in front of you is that you blow all of your steam out in a protest or two, you come home and you feel like you liberated Palestine and then you're done. This needs you to stay engaged and that's a proof of sincerity by the way. Your willingness to stay engaged until the matter is seen to its end. We want a ceasefire right now. We want the end of the killing of innocent people, right? This is the beginning. We want a ceasefire, we want the end of the killing of innocent people. We want occupation to end. We want apartheid to end. We want our brothers and sisters to live in the full freedom that we hope to live with ourselves. Seeing it to its end. I know for a lot of us, subhanAllah, this consciousness was awakened in us, and by the way, this is character building for the young people as well. This is a cause that you need to engage with for the long run, inshallah ta'ala. Right now, it's, you know, we, we want to see people stop dying. Eventually, inshallah ta'ala, we want to see our brothers and sisters live in full prosperity. Stay the course, and the last thing, 
speak. Speak with confidence, bi ta'ala. وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ وَقَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ There's this emphasis in the Qur'an. Speak with confidence. Don't let the fear be seen in your eyes. Don't stutter. I am of the Muslims. We believe in La ilaha illallah. La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil. Fustu Allah. This idea of speaking it and not being afraid to speak is a powerful concept in our deen and we need to nurture that inshallah ta'ala in our young people as well. Speak with wisdom. Speak with courage. Speak with consistency. Be smart. But be sincere. Bidnillahi ta'ala, we hope that we will see that Allah Azza wa Jal liberate our brothers and sisters in Palestine and that we all get a chance to pray in Al Masjid Al Aqsa while it is liberated. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to support our brothers and sisters in Gaza in these dark moments. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to free them from this captivity. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to lift the siege. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open up the ways of sustenance for them, to accept their dead as shuhada, to heal their wounded. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to place us in their service. Allahumma ameen. Wa salli alayhi wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.